Welcome everyone to the seventh in a series of 3D echo clinics on substance use disorders. Looks like we have several people coming back to join us this week. It'd be great if we could do a round of introductions, uh, starting off with the hub clinic. And because you know, now we're seventh in a series of 10, I think we should all do introductions. We could hear from everyone. So please don't be shy. Camera's on. Mary, please, please take it away. Hi, Mary Argonis from Hawaii. And I'm your IT support today. Thank you. Amber. And I'll just pop in next, yeah. Amber Rogers with Mountain Pacific Quality Health. And I, um, for all of those of you that are interested but shy, I want your cases. So don't be shy. And I'm Jessica also with Mountain Pacific, and I'm here just for support. Wonderful. And uh, also on our hub, Dr. Malcolm Horn. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, I, Zoom and I do not talk well. I never find my, my passcode. I always lose it. I don't know. I'm technically challenged. I need help. Um, I'm Malcolm Horn. Uh, I work at Rimrock. Um, and um, I specialize with addiction and substance use treatment um, and mental health together. So the, the co-occurring disorders. So I'm excited to be here. I love being part of ECHO. I love being able to see us actually make changes in the work that we do because um, it can be overwhelming. And so making changes is how we combat that overwhelmingness. So thank you for having me. Excellent, thank you. Eileen Ford. Hi everyone. Yep, my name is Eileen Ford and I am with Mountain Pacific also. I am one of our coalition leaders. So um, have found all of these sessions to be really, really valuable and appreciate participating. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Nurse practitioner Megan Lehman. Hi, I'm Megan Lehman. I'm a nurse practitioner with Frontier Recovery. Excellent. And going down in order of appearance, Hope Kratz. Hi, everyone. I'm Hope Kratz. I'm the clinical director at Menoida Healthcare Network. Um, pleasure to be here. Thank you. Great to see you. Thanks for joining. And Maynette Wong. Hi, I have no camera, but um, I work in the Hawaii office for Mountain Pacific. Excellent. Welcome. I see Dr. Russell Ollerton has joined us. Russell, please, if, if you would introduce yourself. So happy that you and Brian can make it. Yeah, I'm Russell Ollerton. I'm with the University of Washington Psychiatry Program. I'm here in Billings Clinic for the next two years to complete my training, and I'm very happy to be here. Excellent. Thanks for joining. Followed by Dr. Brian Schlitt. Hi, I'm Brian Schlitt. Uh, same as Russell, UW Billings Clinic. So we're very happy and thrilled to welcome Montana's first psychiatry residents. And I'm seeing Sharon Woodward. Hello. Hi, thanks for joining. Yeah, where where are you joining us from? I am a social worker. I work at Wildflower Court. We are a long-term care uh, nursing facility. Excellent, thanks for joining. Yes. Alyssa Dransfield. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. Um, I'm social services director from Colorado. Excellent. Welcome. We got some good geographic diversity. Hawaii, Colorado, Montana. I think Wyoming is also in the house. Jennifer Kien. Uh, she put in chat, she doesn't have a mic or okay. camera, but she is a complex care navigator at the Logan Health in Kalispell. Excellent. All right, and who's connecting from the phone number? I'm seeing the last three are 169. Hi, this is Caitlin Connolly with Mount Pacific Quality Health. I'm joining from Montana. Excellent, thanks for joining. So today we'll be discussing benzodiazepines as a widely prescribed medication and also substance of abuse. Let's first start off with announcements. I think we at least have a couple. Amber? Yes. 
Yeah, this is Amber. Um, so I will be putting into chat a sign-in link. This is for CMEs. Even if you are not a physician and, and you are just registering your, your intention of being here, uh, we need to um, have you put that into the session each time. So it's just a quick link you can access from your phone, your web, whatever. Um, and that is super helpful to me. And then the other thing that I wanted to announce for those of you that may not be aware, we are in the public comment period for a, um, the HEART initiative, which is to expand Medicaid services for substance use disorder, as well as severe, severe and persistent mental illness. So I'm frantically trying to put those links those documents into the Zoom chat, but I'm having technical issues. So I will try to do that throughout our, our time, but um, I can certainly send those um, documents out for those Montana people um, after the event and just filter out um, those of you that aren't in Montana. So that's it. Excellent, thank you. Okay. And that um, it looks like we got a little bit of an echo, great. And, and so that really addresses the continuing education piece. Please um, respond to the link that Amber's putting out um, so you can get credit. It's one credit hour. Brief disclosure just, statement. Just one real quick too. That does, um, we're also giving credit for nursing continuing education credit hours as well. So just FYI. Excellent. A brief disclosure, Drs. Eric Arzubi, Reza Hosseini Gomi, and myself are owners and co-founders of Frontier Psychiatry. Dr. Hosseini Gomi also owns Equity and Brain Check, as well as Biogen. Um, and Amber has the following financial interests listed here. The nurse planner will ensure that the content of this clinic remains free from commercial bias. Our objectives today in discussing benzodiazepines acknowledge how they work, discuss the epidemiology of benzodiazepine use, um, both insofar as a broadly prescribed medication, as well as a substance of abuse, and talk about pertinent concerns, and finally acknowledge current forms of treatment for benzodiazepine use disorder. Let's start off with a case. This is Miss A.N. She's a 47-year-old woman who's coming into your clinic. She currently works part-time in a nursery and is completing a Bachelor of Science degree online. Her past psychiatric history is remarkable for PTSD with panic attacks and long-standing anxiety symptoms. She says she's tried several other medications, including bupropion and quetiapine, uh, and often feels overwhelmed by anxiety. Up until three weeks ago, she was taking prescribed clonazepam, five milligrams total daily dose. She had been taking this dose for one year. Since then, as of last three weeks ago, when she ran out of clonazepam, she had started taking diverted alprazolam, Zanny bars. She either gets from friends or off the street. On one episode, she noted that she passed out, ended up in the ED, and she thinks they gave her Narcan. She's currently off other psychotropics and says benzos are the only thing that works for her as far as helping her with her anxiety. She notes having recurrent rebound anxiety, remarking that if she misses a dose of Xanax, she gets really bad anxiety. Oftentimes she'll wake up in the middle of the night with panic attacks. So these options are not mutually exclusive. It'd be great to have participation here. Don't be shy. And if we do get sustained silence, I will cold call. So do you prescribe gabapentin to facilitate benzodiazepine dose reduction? Engage in motivational interviewing, targeting benzodiazepine use, reduction, cessation. Tolerate long-term benzodiazepine use so long as she's only taking clonazepam. Insist on abstinence from benzodiazepines prior to prescribing any additional psychotropic med. Proceed to treat PTSD and anxiety with evidence-based pharmacological treatment. Refer to a qualified therapist for CBT. Any takers? anything besides three and four are reasonable approaches. I like it. So you want to help the patient 
get off benzos, you're thinking that an anticonvulsant like gabapentin um, could be a reasonable choice. You like the motion, motivational interviewing. You like treating everything co-occurring, the PTSD and anxiety. And CBT, what is it not good for? I like it. Any, any other takers? Same Hi, it's um, Yeah, please. Oh, uh, I would say too, I would uh, utilize motivational interviewing just to identify kind of, you know, where they're at in the stages of change or if they identify the use as anything concerning. And then also paired with the treating PTSD also like, you know, those can include other things like EMDR treatment and that kind of stuff. So I really like those factors as well. Excellent. So you really want to see where the patient is insofar as her willingness to change, whether or not she yeah. even recognizes this as an issue. I yeah, love it. The why. <laughs> and, it and it's patient centric. And, and sure enough, that's what people relate to. I really like it. So I think y'all got this. There's no point in us um, spending a full half an hour going through the rest of the material. So sure enough, would emphasize one, two, five, and six. To talk about benzodiazepines, what we're dealing with chemically, they're characterized by the fusion of a benzene and diazepine ring, as we see here in the case of lorazepam. Leo Sternbach, a Polish-American chemist who accidentally discovered the first benzodiazepine, Librium, in 1955. It was commercialized within the following three years, and shortly thereafter, one of the still most commonly prescribed benzodiazepines, diazepam, known as Valium, by the, the brand name, it came out in 1963. So they've been around longer than, than several of us in this session. They are a central nervous system depressant and common uses include treatment of anxiety, insomnia, alcohol detoxification, as well as an abortive measure for seizures. These uses and the prevalence of anxieties we're about to see made by 1977 benzodiazepines to be the most widely prescribed medication class globally. That's changed since then in part because we've seen SSRIs and other medications come out that will more safely treat anxiety. Yet benzos do still remain one of the most commonly prescribed medications in the world. Um, and then the most commonly used central nervous system depressant in the United States after alcohol. How do benzos work? So in brief, when we think about the neurotransmitter system that is most relevant within the brain, it has to deal with GABA. That's an inhibitory neurotransmitter that binds to ligand gated ion channels depicted here. And when GABA, which is an endogenously released neurotransmitter in the brain, when it binds these ligand gated ion channels, we see an influx of chloride into the cytoplasm, which hyperpolarizes the cell, making it less excitable, depressing it. Benzodiazepines bind the GABA-A receptor and potentiate the effect of GABA, making these ligand gated uh, ion channels open more frequently, increasing the magnitude of the chloride influx making the hyperpolarization, the extent to which this postsynaptic neuron is less likely to respond to stimulus, it makes that even more so the case. So it's a higher degree of depression. How frequently are benzos used? So this is a little bit dated, acknowledging that this was published in a 2015 study using 2008 data, yet it's still largely pertinent. We see in the United States, that as you march through the decades of life, by the time you get to age 60 and above, over 10% of women reported some sort of benzodiazepine use. And correspondingly, it increases for men as well, uh, approaching and just exceeding 6%, a potential reason why benzodiazepines are more commonly used by women in general. And this is all comers, prescribed uh, uh, illicit use, one reason they are more commonly used by women is anxiety 
is all things um, considered more commonly reported, documented, and treated among women. About 2% of Americans over 12 years of age reported illicit benzodiazepine use in the past year. This represents almost 10% of total illicit drug use. Over the 10 years from 2007 to 2017, substance use disorder treatment emissions, so people coming into centers of care, especially residential, um, they saw benzodiazepine use disorder double from a half to a full percent of admissions. It is more prevalent than it was before as a form of substance use. Benzodiazepine intoxication is characterized by many of the same signs we'll see in alcohol intoxication, perhaps with less ataxia. We still though see gross lack of coordination, unsteady gait, slurred speech, cognitive impairment, and remarkably in pterograde amnesia, meaning people cannot, once they're really intoxicated on benzos, they cannot form new memories. The withdrawal from benzodiazepines, once someone does have physiological dependence, it's quite similar to alcohol withdrawal in so far as the signs and symptoms, characterized by autonomic hyperactivity, specifically tachycardia, high blood pressure, tremor, anxiety, insomnia, nausea, as well as vomiting. Complications can include many of the same complications you get in alcohol withdrawal, transient hallucinations, tonic-clonic seizures, and delirium and in extreme cases, death. Benzodiazepines and opioids are two commonly abused, co-abused substances. And the reason being, they have a synergistic effect insofar as the reward people experience. It's a better high. Unfortunately, they also have a synergistic effect in causing severe respiratory depression way more than you would get from the summation of their respective respiratory depressive effects. Commonly abused benzodiazepines uh, for folks who do use opioids include diazepam, midazolam, and alprazolam. And that's specifically due to the fact that all of these are highly lipophilic, meaning they enter the central nervous system a lot faster, so faster onset, and simply put a better high. The prevalence of benzo use among methadone and Suboxone patients, so these are folks on MAT, 51 to 70%. And in 2012, 73% of heroin users entering treatment reported benzodiazepine use in the preceding year. If we look to drug overdose deaths in the country, this data is from the CDC. We've seen that over the 20 year period from 1999 till 2019, an explosion in benzodiazepine overdose deaths. And that's in large part driven by co-abuse of a benzo with an opioid. As we can see in 2019, um, just over half of the benzo overdose deaths involved use of an opioid. When should we suspect a, a patient is abusing their benzodiazepines or somehow getting benzos illicitly and abusing them. Well, it's the core diagnostic criteria for any substance use disorder. We're looking for evidence that somebody's taking larger amounts of benzodiazepines over a longer period than that which was intended, that which was prescribed for. They're spending a lot of time and much of their life energy chasing benzodiazepines. And a common example is people with multiple prescriptions from different providers. Uh, this really uh, beckons us to check the prescription drug registry. Anytime I'm seeing a patient for a substance use disorder, and certainly anytime that a benzodiazepine will come up in discussion, I'm checking the prescription drug registry. It's quite easy to do. Please register and, and pursue this. Other core diagnostic criteria and telltale signs are patients failing to fulfill some core responsibilities they have at home, in the workplace, and to, to other people in their lives. They continue to use despite persistent problems, be it with their health, with their finances, with the people they care about. Important activities are given up. 
uh, or at least reduced, and cravings and an escalation in use, oftentimes people using benzos in hazardous situations. If people are using very high doses of benzos on a daily basis, they can oftentimes present to clinic acutely intoxicated because in part, they at that point really lack insight and fail to appreciate the extent to which they're exhibiting signs of intoxication. And of course, if they go without access, they will enter withdrawal. The acute treatment of benzo abuse and some of this applies for, for tapering people or treating people who have iatrogenic use disorder, prescribed benzaz benzodiazepines for a prolonged period and then want to get off, will oftentimes look to switch people from a shorter acting benzodiazepine like lorazepam to a longer acting benzodiazepine, clonazepam. Another option would be diazepam that's oftentimes used. I stay away from it because it is highly lipophilic and therefore has a significantly higher abuse potential than clonazepam. This can usually be done in the outpatient setting. Some clear indications that inpatient detox should be considered if, is if somebody's failed outpatient detox um, one or more times and or if they have medical comorbidities, especially a history of seizures. We can safely leverage an anticonvulsant medication to facilitate a faster benzo taper I use gabapentin, it's generally safe. We'll dose it 300 milligrams PO, TID, and let patients really decide whether or not they increase the dose, allowing them readily to increase to 600 milligrams PO, TID, and they'll essentially declare themselves insofar as their need for that as an adjunct. And then initially decrease the benzo dose by 20 to 25% right at start of treatment and look to correspondingly decrease it by an equal uh, proportion every week thereafter. We can use alternative anticonvulsants, be it pregabalin, carbamazepine, valproic acid. I find gabapentin is a lot easier to use with fewer side effects. And while we're doing this, we definitely wanna emphasize reduction in the dose um, and ideally eliminating other central nervous system depressants like barbiturates, which aren't too common now, but occasionally pop up, soma and non-benzodiazepine hypnotics, the Z drugs, thinking here mainly of Zolpidem. For long-term treatment, unlike other forms of substance use disorder, there is no evidence-based medication-assisted treatment for benzo, benzo use disorder. Gabapentin and other anticonvulsants can certainly help in the short term by physiologically stabilizing people as they go through the taper, but there's no evidence they help long-term. Cognitive behavioral therapy is definitely evidence-based and makes a meaningful difference insofar as how well people succeed in remaining abstinent from benzo use following a taper. Uh, in the darker et al. meta-analysis, they saw that when cognitive behavioral therapy was added to a benzo taper versus when it was just a benzo taper alone, the relative rate effect was 1.51, statistically significant. Um, CBT, whenever possible, helps with substance use disorders. And here is a great example. We wanna treat co-occurring disorders, simply put, when it comes to benzo use disorder, Untreated depressive and anxiety disorders likely increase the risk of uh, return to use. And as we see across substance use disorders, co-occurring substance use disorders, if they're not adequately treated, can cause a return to use of the primary substance use disorder. To summarize, we acknowledged how benzodiazepines work. They bind. GABA-A receptors enhancing GABA activity, causing CNS depression. We talked about the epidemiology of benzodiazepine use uh, in general, both as a use disorder as well as prescriptions, and talked about pertinent concerns. About 10% of total illicit drug use is attributed to benzo abuse, quite high. And we looked in particular at the deadly cocktail of combining benzos with opioids. 
And we did talk about forms of treatment for benzo use disorder. Long-term, overwhelmingly, the evidence favors tapering with CBT and treating co-occurring disorders. Let me flip over to chat. All right. What questions and or comments do folks have? I have a maybe random question. Your experience, do you feel like if someone has been on benzos for a long period of time, we're talking over a decade, is it possible that for them to truly get off of it? Because I've seen people really struggle with even a low, like a slow taper, they really struggle. And so, you know, do you feel like people truly can get off of them? Or are there some people who are going to be stuck taking benzos for a while, if not the rest of their life? I think that's a great and kind of no holds barred question. I like it. I expect nothing less. That's the way I roll. <laughs> So yes, it's a mixed bag, simply put. I, I'd say from what I've seen, probably treated, I've diagnosed overt benzodiazepine use disorder, meeting core DSM-5 criteria, probably some, oh, I'm, I'm gonna say at least a hundred times. So what has the success, success rate been within the subset of people who've been on benzos, let's say five years plus? Um, I do see it as a function of age, um, and there, there's going to be a lot of confounders here. Um, younger patients tend to fare better. Now, granted, I, I mean, how can you correct for how long they've been on benzos? You know, certainly somebody coming in who's over 70 years old and has been on, say, diazepam for 30 years, uh, never mind their level of motivation. Um, it's an uphill battle. And oftentimes the visit with us as addiction specialists is something prescribed to them by their primary care provider who's now refusing to prescribe the benzo. So I think some of the success is predicated by, okay, where is the patient getting care? And will they have access to benzodiazepines in a ready fashion? if we don't prescribe them. Um, it's, it's a really challenging scenario. I think practicing harm reduction, the immediate emphasis is get them on a safer benzodiazepine. And in general, I transition people to clonazepam and then work to do a very, very, very slow and, and steady taper, especially if they're truly physiologically dependent, which in the case of those older patients who've been on benzos for umpteen years, you bet. And are you going to see an unmasking of PTSD if they have criterion A trauma they've never adequately addressed? Yes, you are. Uh, are they going to be able to um, get adequate treatment for that, appreciate it, and progress? It's a challenge. For some people, it goes well, others not. But I think it's always worth a try. I see another question or statement in chat, and this is from Jennifer Quinn up in yep. uh, Logan. And um, she notes that the problem that she sees is that providers have responded similarly, similarly, can't say that word, with um, regarding opioids. And I know that from our pharmacists at Mountain Pacific, we're encouraging people to taper the opioids first rather than the, the benzodiazepines yes. because it takes so much longer. But, you know, there's a fine balance, especially in an elderly population of, you know, how do you taper them off even opioids in a, if they truly do have a chronic pain? And it's, it's just a huge knot and how to, how to unwind that mm -hmm. It's easier not to start it than it is to unwind it. Yeah, I think you're, you're identifying a lot of salient issues. Um, thank you, Jennifer. I think that's um, a great concern you raise. And, and Amber, I think you really give it a lot of weight, emphasizing what you're seeing at Mount Pacific. You know, if we, if we have to make a choice as, as physicians, nurse practitioners, providers, we're always going to emphasize 
reducing the dose, eliminating the opioid. Simply put, given it can cause absolute apnea, an opioid is always more dangerous. That said, benzos in combination with other respiratory depressants, especially when somebody has cardiac pulmonary comorbidities, COPD is a, is a common example. The tipping point for an apneic event going into respiratory failure, failure is way more readily reached than it would be for the all-comer population. So opioids always have to go um, and whenever possible, get people off of them. What next, um, especially when we're dealing with co-occurring chronic pain? I oftentimes have to have a frank conversation as collaborative and as compassionately as possible, acknowledging my scope of practice as an addiction psychiatrist, I don't overtly treat pain. I can appreciate in conversation with a patient and acknowledge that by prescribing buprenorphine, the patient is seeing some analgesia as well. They should, it's a partial mu opioid receptor agonist. It's going to offer that, but I can't go in and say, Hey, we're not treating opioid use disorder. This is for pain. Um, so that is in some ways a systems issue and how we've kind of artificially teased out use disorder from uh, chronic pain. And so far as getting people off benzos, uh, again, in that scenario where we have concomitant use of an opioid and a benzo, emphasize the opioid first, and then we'll do everything we can with a benzo. Um, our dose reduction is going to go a long ways in so far as keeping that person safe. Um, acknowledging that the, the risk of falls and other untoward events goes way up as people get older and stay on a benzo. Um, so a lot of what we're trying to emphasize now is prevention. And I, I feel like newer generations of physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs are a lot more reluctant to start a benzodiazepine. And Jennifer, I see that you got on to the some kind of a video. Um, if you're able to chat and you know discuss further, you can open up your your uh, unmute yourself. And she disappears. <laughs> Sometimes there's only so much bandwidth. Exactly. A lot of people have clinic. I want to be mindful of that. Any cases impromptu are always welcomed. We, we did have a case for today. It looks like the presenter was unable to make it. Megan, can we bug you for updates on any one of the, the several patients you've discussed with us in Echo Clinic? I'm thinking. Yeah. I think I just discussed the one, uh, the buprenorphine patient that was using multiple substances. Yes, yes. Yeah. Can we get, could you give us a status update? So she fell off of treatment for about the last three weeks. Oh, I'm so sorry. If, if you don't mind, I just give him like a brief identifying statement, kind of age and, um, and, yeah. and diagnosis. So, um, 39 year old. Um, she abuses opioids, methamphetamine cannabis, um, anything she can get her hands on, it seems. Um, she has been seeing me for probably three or four months. Um, she started with the buprenorphine in the beginning and stayed off the opioids, but continued the other substances. She was able to get a job. She was able to get an apartment because she was homeless when I first met her. Um, she has a history of anxiety and depression, PTSD, um, has kind of gotten a little better on some sertraline and I've given her quetiapine at night. And um, interestingly, you asked me for an update. She showed up this morning for the first time in a month. So she wants to get back on treatment and has lost her job, lost her apartment in the month. I didn't see her. So we're starting back up. How is her engagement in chemical dependency counseling? Have, have they given you many updates? I, I haven't asked, actually. I don't think she's gone. Um, yeah. she, uh, missed her appointment yesterday with them. So um, I encouraged her to schedule an appointment tomorrow. So 
I don't know if that's happened or not. Well, that, that's wonderful. She's making a return to treatment. Yeah. And, and, that's, and that's certainly going to be something that you can emphasize moving forward, like what you're looking for insofar as uh, chemical dependency, counseling attendance, attendance at group. You know, oftentimes um, we're doing everything we can in a, an environment that does have somewhat kind of um, artificially segmented care. Um, we don't see the chemical dependency counseling uh, always emphasized. And so it's, it's great that we can acknowledge its importance and, and urge patients to, to make it in. And I don't know if I had any other cases. That's they, perhaps you didn't. I'm just thinking across the the various kind of forums you yeah. interact in. Thank you. That's a great update. I want to ask maybe a stupid question. Shoot. Is the seizure threshold, do you have the same considerations for seizures with a benzo withdrawal as you do for an alcohol withdrawal? Uh, generally speaking, sure. Um, in clinical experience, I'll say, well, it, it just, the thing about alcohol use disorder, especially when it's quite severe and people are using um, unseemly amounts, you almost don't know how much they've been drinking. And so I've seen that turn south a lot faster than, than benzo withdrawal. Of course, I've seen a lot more alcohol withdrawal um, throughout training and, and, my, and my practice. But in general, if you think about what happens within the brain, so you have two opposing systems of neurotransmitters, GABA, which is inhibitory versus glutamate, which is excitatory. So what happens with acute use of a CNS depressant like alcohol or a benzodiazepine, because it's gonna potentiate GABA, it's gonna increase the relative GABA load. And so you're gonna see net inhibition. And it, part of what happens is people experience a certain euphoria and relaxation that comes along with that. What happens with daily consumption, the point where you see physiological dependence, you're gonna see neuroadaptation. Specifically, the glutamate system is going to rev up to relatively speaking, match this new GABA level. And this new GABA level is being maintained by daily use of a benzo or alcohol. And so what happens when you suddenly take that benzo away? Because of neuroadaptation, you have relative glutamate excess. And glutamate is, is implicated in seizure activity. So it makes sense that you know, in somebody who is truly physiologically dependent, on a benzo or alcohol, they're set up for seizures. Now, oftentimes in the clinical setting, we can stay on top of that using CWA protocol, which also works for benzo withdrawal and treat accordingly, oftentimes using benzodiazepines as well as an anticonvulsant. Um, but in general, if somebody's been on a daily dose of a benzodiazepine, I'd say in kind of clonazepam equivalents of really one milligram or, or greater, especially as they age, they, they can exhibit complex benzodiazepine withdrawal. Um, one of the things that goes underappreciated uh, all too often, especially in the elderly, is benzo withdrawal-induced delirium. Um, because older folks in general, older organ, the brain, it's more going to be more susceptible to kind of acute stressors and hospitalizations of big stress. Throw in the mix a big shift in what's happened through the process of neuroadaptation, they can end up getting really confused and, and frankly delirious. And it kind of goes unnoticed that the, the benzo withdrawal is contributing. Of course, benzos can cause delirium, so it's, it's a slippery slope, but these are all concerns that we kind of deal with in, in treating uh, folks who have um, uh, benzo dependence. I was wondering, Robert, if you could talk a little bit about benzo use disorder and pregnancy and like, I guess like, for example, tapering while pregnant and if that's a good idea and yeah, take it from there. Yeah, no. So um, if, if you look at fetal outcomes, it is the right thing to do um, to get uh, pregnant mothers off of benzos. Um, 
granted, you're going to be want to be really conservative in in so far as how you do it, acknowledging that a lot, if not all of the anticonvulsants I can think of, have some level of contraindication in in pregnancy. Um, so I would go for a taper. Um, perhaps looking to do, you know, what you would normally do over the course of a month, over six to seven weeks. Um, treated way more opioid use disorder in pregnancy than benzo use disorder. And part of that probably has to do with kind of the level of psychosocial distress that comes with opioid use disorder versus benzo use disorder, especially kind of at that phase in life. On average, if people are abusing benzodiazepines, illicit or otherwise, um, they haven't gone far enough for it to get really, really bad, if that makes sense. Whereas opioids, opioid abuse tends to be um, a lot more severe earlier on. Thank you. Great question. I'll be really interested um, to, to hear from our resident physicians over the course of the next few months, um, what differences in prescribing practices they're seeing across regions. I think it's gonna be, in particular, thinking about benzodiazepines. Um, it'd be wonderful to hear kind of your, your take on what you see. Um, common enough everywhere, I feel like, at least from what I've seen firsthand, the use varies from, from state to state. We're talking um, kind of the rate of prescription. Yeah, jumping in, uh, I think that it is still somewhat provider dependent and there seems to be a great deal of system de dependency. Uh, certainly in the geriatric population, there are uh, trends towards tapering to discontinuance of benzodiazepines, but in practice, uh, there seems to be a uh, acceptable level that um, 0.25 of clonazepam BID in uh, anyone over the age of 65 is probably as good as you're going to get, especially in a region that uh, illicit substances are so readily available. Um, however, uh, noticing in other systems and with a lot younger providers, there's a large uh, hesitancy to prescribe any benzodiazepines or any medications that have the potential for abuse. And uh, that has extended in some cases to uh, even some medications as gabapentin uh, being not prescribed as frequently, but that's, you know, that's rare cases uh, that we've just seen in, co, uh, in, in our cohort. Uh, Russell can probably speak to that uh, just as well as he's rotated in any of the same areas that I have. Thank you, Brian. That it's. I think it'll be it'll be a uh, a lively conversation we can have here in a few weeks. Um, so Brian's coming from Seattle, uh, where where I trained as well at the University of Washington, um, and I certainly noticed when I arrived in Billings, uh, at least a twofold kind of rate of, of benzo prescriptions in, in comparison to Seattle. And Brandy Colvin has joined us. And uh, I believe she may have a case. We're very, very um, excited that nurse practitioner Brandy Colvin can, can tell us about her patient. Hello, sorry, I was a little late getting here. No worries. Um, so yeah, I was going to present on a patient It's kind of going back to the week where we talked about ADHD. And so just wanted to present this patient. So I have a 21 year old male patient, um, who came in to see me about a month ago and is wanting chief complaint that he wants to get back on his ADHD meds that he was prescribed. Um, he started taking ADHD meds in early high school, um, was diagnosed as a child with ADHD and his dad was kind of resistant to meds 
finally decided it might be a good idea in high school. So he started taking them. Um, so it, he came to me with, um, he got to collect myself a little bit. He um, has, so he's taking clonidine right now for um, insomnia. And he says that that is helpful. So he was diagnosed with ADHD. Um, he does have a history of childhood trauma, um, emotional verbal abuse in the household on the part of his dad. His mom was also an alcohol abuser and died from pancreatic cancer when he was two years old. So. Um, his PCL5 was 50 out of 80 when he came in. Um, so he he got he w had some suicidal ideation um, back in 2019. While he was taking the Adderall, he also um, started using meth and alcohol at the same time and got a DUI in 2019. He was actually trying to outrun the police. And when they did end up getting him stopped, he said that he was actually hoping that they would shoot him at the time, but that's the only time he's had suicidal ideation and he like that. And he attributed it, attributes it to the meth and the alcohol, um, no suicide attempts, um, he does endorse mood swings that last over a few hours, but none lasting days. Um, no past psychiatric admissions. Um, as far as substances, he hasn't used alcohol since June of 2020. He used opiates in high school. Um, Marijuana he used in high school and last in 2019, rarely used it, didn't like it the way it made him feel. Same with benzos, tried them, but they put him to sleep. He does use nicotine daily, half a pack for three years. And the Adderall he was prescribed, took that for two years. He did have a history of intermittent meth use. Um, he also uses Kratom daily now, which he says actually helps with symptoms of concentration, attention, focus. He does um, his PHQ-9. When he came in to see me, it was 13 out of 27 and his GAD-7 was 10 out of 21. Um, as far as symptoms that he has, he does endorse like anxiety, irritability, um, low mood at some points. He says that mostly like he will have angry outbursts, um, hyper reactivity, irritability, anxiety, and just like overall kind of low mood and shame. Um, he did try a course of Lamictal prior to seeing me just for overall mood instability. There was a question, I guess, of whether or not he had a bipolar two diagnosis, but he said that, I mean, he doesn't really have any past episodes not being on substances of any hypomanic or manic episodes. And like I said, his mood swings kind of tend to go over the course of hours and not days. And he's never had any period of time where he goes without sleep and doesn't really have a need for sleep. So, um, his, but he said that Lamictal made him tired and not feel like himself. And it also kind of interfered with his sex drive. So he really feels like if he could just tackle his symptoms of ADHD right now, that his life would improve significantly. Um, he says at work, he is unable to concentrate and focus on tasks and he feels like his irritability and agitation is more caused to ADHD than anything else. Although we did go over the fact that some of his symptoms do seem to correspond with his 
past history of trauma, like the PTSD side of things. So I did do UDS and it came back um, negative for everything except for Kratom, which is what he had endorsed to me. Um, he says he uses the Kratom to help with overall symptoms of concentration and focus and that if he could get back on his ADHD meds that he wouldn't have to use that and he would be willing to, you know, demonstrate that. But he just can't do that right now without treatment. So we're just ask, still kind of <laughs> okay, go ahead. Ask, what what dose of Kratom is he using? Does he identify uh, that? He he doesn't. Okay. So a very compelling case. Thank you. Um Brandy, this is a lot of co-occurrence. We like it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll do my best to, to do a quick um, summary statement. Keep me honest. 21 year old gentleman with ADHD, PTSD, past alcohol, methamphetamine use, who is now actively using Kratom, does not necessarily identify it as an issue, presenting for care with the overt request to start a prescription stimulant for ADHD. Yes. Uh, so there's a lot here. Um, I think to acknowledge kind of in broad strokes, I like how you did the PCLC, which uh, for those who aren't familiar is the PTSD checklist civilian version. Really any score 35 and greater is concerning for PTSD and a 50, oof, that, that gets it right there. Um, and remarkably, you know, this is somebody who is still concerned about function says he has a lot at stake and can identify kind of, okay, this is what I need. Um, that's good, especially because it gives us not only a feel for his potential function going forward, but also something that we can leverage in a collaborative way in acknowledging with him, hey, we want to help you return to function as much as possible. Let's see really what's, what's at stake, what's going on. Um, I, I think you're right to definitely question um, whether or not kind of bipolar two was ever a legitimate diagnosis with stimulants on board, kratom in the mix. It's it's hard to know. Um, in particular, one thing that that can be really helpful with kratom is identifying if the dose is below or above five grams. Below five grams, it's more of a stimulant. Above five grams, it's acting much more like an opioid. Think about the equal strength to buprenorphine. Um, and people have just as hard of a time getting off of it as an opioid. Uh, so that's one thing we do need to acknowledge and get a sense of like, how long you've been on this, how much are you using? Um, and really there's no therapeutic place in so far as kind of a medical benefit of Kratom that I know of. It is a substance of abuse. Um, and I think acknowledging concern about it uh, can go a long way, at least in so far as educating the patient, um, and even making kind of prescription of a stimulant contingent on abstinence from all substances of, of, of use, or at least reduced use. Mm -hmm. A tough thing is kind of unlike we'd be able to do with, with opioids, um, and other substances, getting a quantitative level of, of Kratom, like a quantitative you're in drug screen, that's going to be challenging. I'm sure it's out there. I don't know how to get it uh, or whether or not it's even available in our market in, in Montana. So how do you like basically say, oh, your use is reduced. Maybe now we'll think about a prescription stimulant. You may have to acknowledge kind of abstinence is the target. Um, he is allowed to have ADHD, PTSD with all these substance use disorders. And certainly we know overwhelmingly if you have ADHD, your risk of having a substance use disorder is way higher, ever more the reason to treat. Um, I'd be very reluctant to use Adderall uh, simply because it is a prescription stimulant that can be abused, whereas something like Vyvanse, with dexamphetamine, it's a prodrug. Unless people ingest it, they're not going to see it bioavailable. Uh, so it can't be snorted or injected. Um, that that's one thing to consider. Do you know if he's Medicaid? He, uh, actually, no, he is Cigna. Okay. And that's one thing I I've run into a lot. Amazingly Medicaid covers, uh, Vyvanse, whereas a lot of the private 
insurance companies don't and it's expensive so that can be yeah. tough so i i guess i was wondering so the urine drug screen they give you a level when it comes back so you are seeing a quantitative level of the kratom yeah let me i have it right here that's awesome yeah i'd love to know what the, who the vendor is so let me look Oh, no, it doesn't give an exact level. It just says over a certain threshold 500. Yeah. Okay. So there's really no way to know um, if he's reducing the amount he's using. Like, it's, it's, yeah. it's tough, you know, kind of, it's that, that dialectic, like, are we going to, tolerate some use and engage in treatment or then versus wait until somebody's fully abstinent. It's hard. Um, right. In Is, this scenario, it, it, it'd be nice to know kind of what he sees as a goal. Clearly he's saying kind of treatment of ADHD. Are there other things? Yeah. Well, his goal is he says that he really sees a benefit as far as just trying to get work done and be able to just focus in general. He said before he started taking Adderall, he was failing at everything. So he said it was really, you know, beneficial. It was when he started using other substances that it became problematic. Um, so it sounds like he's using it as a coping tool for some of the symptoms i just like is there an issue treating with both like say vivance and he's still using kratom is there what what do you think yeah so i mean a concern there and i really welcome um people to to chime in um the kind of nice thing about these cases it gets us all thinking about kind of what we do in, in a similar situation about patients that we're, we're treating right now who have some, some of these concerns. Um, so please don't be shy. Uh, Megan, you're, you're free to jump in. I know this has come up a few times or not, that's fine. But so with Kratom use, you can see acute intoxication just like you would with an opioid, especially when the, mm -hmm. the dose is creeping up above five grams. And people, you know, um, when they have a hefty dose of Kratom on board, they're gonna get sedated. They're not gonna be able to focus. Um, Megan and I actually did an assessment of a patient who endorsed using um, a fair amount of Kratom. Um, like I think it was, if I recall correctly, 10 grams a day. And that patient was intoxicated during the assessment to the point that we, okay. when we did kind of the, you know, delayed three word recall, and, and some other things, it was notable. Um, so I, I question with Kratom, especially given at the higher doses, it's gonna be sedating and have many of the same effects as an opioid. Kind of question like, what are we doing at that point? If we're concerned about treating your ADHD and we have something tried and true that you appreciate benefiting from in the past, this prescription stimulant, and yet there's Kratom, something that we know, especially at higher doses, it's gonna make you loopy. Never mind dependent. It's kind of like, what are we doing there? How is this making sense? Right. And he has not presented that way at all. He is very clear and organized and coherent. So I've never, I've seen him three times now over the course. And, uh, and he's always presented very well. So uh, simply put, I don't see an immediate contraindication to using a prescription okay. stimulant, um, especially, you know, if, if he doesn't have any sort of medical comorbidities, the standard stuff we look into arrhythmias mm -hmm. and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's mainly more of a concern for, for the ADHD, like, is he truly going to benefit um, right. if he continues to use Kratom and escalates use? Okay. Right. Well, I've, I know the goal is abstinence, but um, I just didn't know if in the meantime, if he's truly using it as a coping yeah. mechanism for these symptoms. So, okay. Thank you. That's a, I that's apologize. A great, I that's late. a great I'm case. So no, thank you so much for joining. That's, that's an awesome case. Okay. I, I, I love the co-occurrence. Yeah. Come back and 
tell us more. Yeah, I'll let you know after I see him the next time. Excellent. Awesome. Thanks again, Brandy. Well, Thanks, everyone. Yeah, take care. Thank you. Okay, hey, everybody. Um, thank you. Don't forget to sign in. And there is an evaluation at the end of each session. So I do read all those. And I share any significant comments with Dr. Seiss. So fill out your evaluation forms too. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye.